Cars. Cars are the most amazing invention of the 20th century. Cars have transformed society. We can move about. They have really changed and shaped the, the planet in ways never seen before. With the good side comes the bad side. Cars have transformed the planet in so many different ways. It's unbelievable. We have about 800 million cars today and light trucks in the world. And the population of cars is multiplying faster than the population of people. You, you all, waste hours and hours in traffic jams. In fact, in the United States, all of the US wastes 4.2 billion hours every year in traffic jams. It's not 4.2 billion hours in a car, it's 4.2 billion hours wasted. And to just give you a feel for how much that is, it took about 7 million human hours to build the Empire State Building and about 20 million human hours to build the Panama Canal. So if we could transform bad, congested traffic into good working traffic for just half a day, we could reconstruct the Empire State Building. That's the amount of time we're, we're wasting. And I know you all know about this because you all use cars, okay? With the good and the bad comes the ugly. 1.2 million people lose their lives every year in traffic accidents. 50 million more get injured. In certain population groups, Cars and car accidents have become the number one cause of death. In the United States, it's the age group from 3 to about 39. From 3 to 16, you're not allowed to drive a car. You can almost none of the benefits. We're still allowed to die of cars. That's a humanitarian failure. It's a crime against our youth that we tolerate the technology it is so insanely dangerous, it dwarfs everything else. And we, we never talk about it. We just take it for granted. Every day. All of us. That's how I feel. I feel the pain. I'm an innovator. And innovators are fundamentally unhappy people. We, we see something and it's wrong, like traffic. But in, in addition to just complaining about it, which I just did, thanks for listening, we also try to find solutions. So the core of innovation is to find solutions, even if the solutions depart from what, anything we've seen before. I teach classes on innovation at Stanford and also to my peers at Google. And one of the diagrams I always put up is this one over here, because it really summarizes how you place yourself as an innovator relative to the progressing world. I call this the pyramid of pain. We all are in pain. You know this. We have personal pains, little things that care, we care about, and if we fix it and innovate about it, we'll be happier people. No one else cares. Our peer group, our family, our work group might have a pain, and I'd say most engineers that I know focus their energy on work group pain of their immediate peer group. There's a small number of them understand it's much smarter to go for pain that affects the entire organization. And those are the guys you promote. They get all the degrees and honors and, and, and raises in your company because they fix something of importance that matters to the entire company. Where I think we should focus is the pain that affects the world. There's 7 billion people right now. Almost all of them, one way or another, use cars. So every hour I invest, trying to fix the car problem, I spend that hour about five billion times as efficiently to fix my own personal problem. Second part to innovation is actually really simple. And here's my diagram for this. Uh, listen, decide, do. Um, as an innovator, th if you follow this recipe, this is the, the slide that summarizes my entire life, it turns out. If, if you follow this recipe, it's actually really easy to, to be innovative, which is, it comes in three phases, and you have to mark these phases as distinct and know which phase you're in, and never flip back to the previous phase. Okay, so listen means you study a problem, and I'll show you examples in a second. 
Decide means you make a decision, and do is you execute a decision. Okay? So let me give you three examples. The final one will involve all of you in this specific loop. Back in 2003, the US government, DARPA, invented the DARPA Grand Challenge. It was a challenge to build a car that could drive itself from Barstow, California to Prim. Without a driver inside and without remote control, the car to be able to really drive itself. Okay? I looked at this and laughed. I felt that's easy. In fact, it was so easy, that the, it was made even easier by the fact that the government didn't tell the cars just go to Prim and follow the signs. It gave a meticulous set of GPS breadcrumbs to make it even easier where to drive. And at the time, I looked at this as a robotic scientist and felt, look, this is so simple, I'm not even worth my time. One of the biggest mistakes I've made. Okay? Come the race. I actually went to the race. Come the race. It was amazing. Of the 15 vehicles that started, half of them didn't even make the first mile. <laughs> Carnegie Mellon's robot, which was the strongest, made a mere seven miles before it went up in smoke. And some of the vehicles, like the next one I show you from UC Berkeley, didn't even make it out of the starting gate. <laughs> so I saw this and said, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I should listen more carefully. Maybe that's actually a hard problem. So I decided, and I made a singular decision to spend my next year on solving the channel, uh, the challenge. I did nothing else at this point. I canceled my classes, I disappeared in the desert, and I started this specific group of students in a specific class for that purpose um, to build the first robotic self-driving car that could drive 140 miles as opposed to just seven miles. We outfitted a vehicle with the help of Volkswagen with all kinds of sensors and computers and interfaces. Uh, here's a little depiction of how the sensor data looks like. These are laser data acquired by so-called laser rangefinders that build a 3D point cloud of this uh, surrounding environment. Um, and it worked really well on Stanford's campus. This is a first test that took place uh, on the uh, roof of the metal garage. Um, we had these emulated desert obstacles, also known as uh, paper boxes, and our car <laughs> drove around very accurately. Uh, you might be surprised to find that there's a place at Stanford that has no cars parked there. The truth is, when we started our research, there were lots of people parking there, and every time someone came by and asked what we're doing, we told them. So after a short time, <laughs> <laughs> we had the space for ourselves. <laughs> In the desert, things were daunting, frustrating. Our cars would go at a snail pace, and the slightest deviation, obstacle different from a, a cart box, would trip it off. And we would find our vehicle in situations like the one I'll show you in a second, where we would get stuck in mud and drive off the road uncontrollably. How wrong had I been thinking this was an easy problem? And we weren't the only ones. Our friends from Carnegie Mellon flipped their vehicle, and our friends from UC Berkeley <laughs> experienced. <laughs> now, I spent the entire year in the desert and among the many insights that we had to make this technology work was the paramount insight to stop treating the car like a computer and starting treating it like a peer. By which I mean, instead of writing code at night and, and, and codifying every single contingency that might occur, we would take it out for a spin in the morning. First, it would watch us and emulate our driving style as a way to become more competent, just the way you, you teach a student how to drive. And eventually, we enabled it to train itself. We gave it the ability to perceive during the race and learn new things. In this video, it would use this laser to find drivable terrain at a short range and 10 times a second sharpen its brain to understand how to find similar looking terrain at longer range, thereby allowing it to move faster than the range of its laser would otherwise permit it. The race itself took place about five years ago, as Walter mentioned, and it was a historical, mind-changing event to all of us who participated. 
the cars went out at, in the morning uh, on a 130-mile course. About mile 103, our vehicle, Stanley, was able to pass our only real competitor, Carnegie Mellon University at the time. And we went through steep mountain trails and the most ardent terrain you can imagine. After about six hours and 54 minutes, our vehicle safely made it back by itself in a completely computer-driven fashion. And it became the first robot to ever finish a DARPA Grand Challenge, winning us at Stanford $2 million prize money. That was really amazing. A moment I will never forget. Thank you. Uh, we spent uh, about half a million dollars on this in total. Um, the car itself is now visible in the uh, Smithsonian National Museum of American History. Um, Wired magazine made a competition of 50 uh, most influential robots, of which ours came in first. Uh, but the most interesting thing for me was actually this children's book that they can buy in Germany, that on page 50 depicts, asks the question, that the cars can drive themselves, and it depicts a, a picture of our car without any, any reference to us or, or the history behind us to teach children what the future looks like. That's quite amazing to me. Now, let me move on and talk about Google. Once again, we found ourselves in a position to restart innovation. We've met the goal we had to, to meet before, and we asked, what's the next big step? And after listening to many experts, we felt the biggest thing to do is to drive everywhere. Drive where we drive, not just in the desert. So we started building a car that drove in traffic. In traffic, you encounter all kinds of stuff. Other people, bicyclists, pedestrians, joggers. You have to deal with a huge spectrum of complex contingencies such as toll booth. The video you're seeing here has all been recorded by a self-driving car. This is all without any human intervention whatsoever. Our cars drive on mountain roads. They drive at night. They even drove Lombard Street, which is the crooked street in San Francisco, by themselves, without any human intervention. And I'll show you a final sequence of a construction zone on a busy interstate highway. All self-driven. It's really doable. Now, to do this, I got my former competitors under one team at Google. On the right is Chris Urmson, who ran the Carnegie Mellon team. At the center is Anthony Lewandowski, who ran the Berkeley team. And we all teamed up, and we hired about 15 super brilliant non-automotive engineers to work with us. And within a year, or a year and a half, we were able to master a challenge we set ourselves before we did anything, but we carved out a thousand reference miles in California to be the most difficult miles you can possibly imagine, including driving from San Jose to San Francisco on El Camino Real, which is a, not a highway, it's more like a, uh, a local artery, um, and driving from Mountain View, where Google is, to the campus in Santa Monica, Los Angeles. We built these cars. Um, these cars drive every day. They've driven over 140,000 miles autonomously to date. Uh, they blend in, and we've been doing this for quite a while. And until recently, no one had even noticed that these cars existed. They drove so smoothly. Um, and here's just some examples of the vehicle driving in an urban area. Uh, this kind of stuff you've probably never seen before. Uh, I know of no other project that is able to do this at this present point. This car, again, is completely hands-off, self-driving. There's people inside for safety that it can take over at any point in time. But other than that, the vehicle is able to do everything by itself and just give you a final uh, animation of the type of stuff that the car is able to process and perceive. Here is a glimpse into the computer models that drive the car's behavior, and you can see a corridor for driving, you can see markings of other vehicles, uh, pedestrians and so on, in different colors. So that's what exists today. So let me talk about the final challenge. My life will have failed if I can't bring this technology to all of us. So my final challenge is for you to listen to me, which you've done, thank you, <laughs> to make your decision, and if you make your decision, to help me turn this into something real, because that's the only thing that matters. And I, I want to motivate why you should care. 
there's things you might never have thought about before. Did you, for example, know that almost all of congestion has nothing to do how many cars there are and how many miles we drive? It has all to do with how we use our real estate, our highways? I can prove it to you. This is a highway at peak capacity when it has the highest throughput. If you're driving about 50 miles per hour, 55 miles per hour, not bumper to bumper because throughput goes down as you get congested. If you take a highway like this and start counting what surface area of the highway is actually occupied by cars and what is still available in between, you'll find that about 92% or more is the space between cars. And only 8% is occupied. That means the way we drive and operate highways today leaves 92% of the roadway unutilized. Think about that. What if we could occupy, have these cars drive a little bit closer together to bring it up to 16% occupancy, still 84% empty, it would double the capacity of the highway system. If you're one of these people who argue the only way to solve this transition problem is to move traffic off the road onto rail, think again. We have the space. We're just not using it. Do you know we have 800 million cars? Who here has a car? Everybody. What are your cars doing right now? Do you know of these 800 million cars, on average 96% are parked and have their engine off? Do you know that we built enormous infrastructure to deal with this massive problem of cars just sitting there? There are cities are horribly looking full of parked cars. What if you, when you drove to work, would never park your car? You just say, goodbye, and it went home, and it picks up your spouse. <coughs> Wouldn't that be amazing? It's completely conceivable to cut the number of cars in half without any reduction in quality of life for us. In fact, an improvement of quality of life for us, but just enabling the most basic of all car-sharing ideas. And finally, did you know that all, all human accidents are caused by the same thing? <laughs> human neglect is lack of attention, <laughs> lack of skill. This is real. <laughs> Let me just show you the next one. I guess I'm out of time. Um, lack of attention, lack of skills. <laughs> Robots are never inattentive. Robots don't text, or if they text, they do this in a multitasking way that doesn't distract from the driving skill. It's quite amazing. So I think we can really reduce traffic accident by 90% down to a tenth rate as today. We can reduce uh, wasted commute time by 90%. We can reduce energy waste by 90%. And we can reduce number of cars by 90% by just moving a step forward. So my question, my challenge to all of you is think about this. Be bothered by what traffic is today and be ready to take the next step because when this step comes, I will be calling on all of you, your legislators, your lawyers, your engineers, your mothers and your fathers and your drivers to help me turn this into reality. Thank you very much.